up. My forward button's not working. Sorry about this. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on men's health and well-being in Middlesbrough. Um, it's really nice to have you all with us today. Um, yeah, so we're here to talk about uh, men's health and well-being really in South Tees. And uh, Richie might talk a little bit more about that, about the kind of expansion of, of Borough Mancan beyond Middlesbrough. Um, but I think a lot of you are here because you, you work in that area anyway. So um, uh, my name's Shalina Bishram. I'm a senior lecturer in public health at Newcastle University. So I'm just here to do the kind of welcome and a bit of background to the research. I really want to talk. Well, I'd give myself until 10 past one. So I'm going to try and uh, keep it as brief as possible to leave plenty of time for the, the kind of real meat of the webinar. <clears throat> I just want to start off by saying happy International Men's Day, hopefully. Um, most, if not all of you already knew that was uh, what today today's day is significant for and, and uh, I guess the kind of a, a big part of the rationale for why we chose the date for this webinar. Um, the theme of this year's International Men's Day is better relations between men and women, which is really nice. Um, so myself and Mabel, who you'll hear from later, we're two women who've been working on this men's health project uh, with Richie and lots of other um, colleagues over the past year. So it's, it's really nice to be here today talking about the research. Uh, so the program, as I said, I'm going to try and uh, not, not waffle on for too long before I hand over to Richie, um, who is um, a health improvement specialist with Public Health South Tees, and he's going to give an overview of the Borough Mancan campaign. So some of you might already know a bit about Borough Mancan, some of you might not know anything about it, so I think hopefully that'll be really useful to you. And I do know from the registration forms where I ask people what... Um, uh, to, to, to tell us why they were hoping to come along to the webinar that a lot of people did say it was, um, you know, I, I didn't take offence that you weren't really excited about the research uh, and that you're more excited about learning about how you can make better links with Borough Mancan. So um, that's part of what we're trying to achieve uh, from, from today. Um, when Richie's finished, we'll go over to Mabel, a colleague of mine at Newcastle University, who's going to talk through some of the key findings from the study. Obviously, this is something we've been working on for quite a few months, and uh, today we're only able to provide a, a snapshot, um, and you'll get access to the final report after it's um, kind of been published. Um, once Mabel's finished, she'll hand over to uh, John and Matthew, two of our peer researchers who've been working really closely with us on the research. So they're going to um, share some of their reflections on what it was like to be a peer researcher, but also talk about some things they heard through their interviews with local men. Um, and then if there's time at the end, I'll just come back on and thank everyone and, and do a bit of a, a close of the event. So each of the speakers there has got about 25 minutes. That we've asked people to talk for about 20 minutes and leave at least five minutes for fine, for discussions and kind of Q&A. There's not a huge amount of time, but we really hope there's some time for, for interaction and for any questions to be answered. Um, and what I really would have loved, especially with it being International Men's Day and trying to have a bit of a celebration is for this to have happened in person rather than online. And I think obviously online, it means that some people who physically couldn't attend on the day might might have been able to make it and obviously we're able to record and that's really great but it would have been really nice if we were meeting over tea and coffee and biscuits and, and all in the same room and so that part of the purpose of today was not just to share what we found but to encourage networking uh, between partners interested in men's health in, in South Tees or beyond. Um, so what I will do is share that information you've put on the registration form about um, you know, if you're interested in Borough Mancan and want to make better links, I'll share that with Richie, unless you tell me not to do that. Um, so Richie will have access to that information, but nobody else will. So what I thought was if you wanted to use the Zoom chat function, just to say a bit about yourself, you're free to do that. Say a bit about which organisation you're representing today, share contact details if, if you do want to make links between people, um, other people on the call. Uh, or you can use the Padlet. So this is for anyone who hasn't used it before. It's kind of a virtual equivalent of a sort of flip chart where you'd kind of put up post-it notes, but you're just doing that kind of electronically. Um, and just for anyone who's never used Padlet before, I thought I'd just uh, show you a couple of screen grabs. So this is what it looks like. I checked earlier and no one had put anything up yet, but it'll stay open for at least a couple of weeks. So you, you, you can, um, I'll put the link to the Padlet in the chat after I finish talking. And you're welcome to put things on there throughout the webinar, or you can fill it in afterwards if, if you think it would be useful to share your contact details with other people. Um, so you, you, this little plus in the corner there, you hover over that and it changes into a, a pen and you can click on there and a, a box pops up and that's your kind of post-it note that you would stick on, on the wall. And you can just write a little bit about who you are um, and a little bit about what you're, you know, 
what links you're hoping to make and when I did and then you, you kind of click publish and that goes on there as a little sticky note and what I forgot to do in my example is put my contact details so don't forget to do that um, uh, so that you know people are able to contact you afterwards. So just a bit of background to the research that we're going to talk about today. Um, Rich is going to cover the kind of men's health needs in, in the South Tees area, so I'm not going to go into all of that, but um, really where all this came from was Richie. So uh, I found this picture online. I don't know if Richie approves of it. Look, it's like the younger version. Um, so Rich, <laughs> are you happy with that, Richie? Well, it's, it's, I don't mind. I, I can tell you, I, there's a story behind that picture as well, but I'll not bore you with the details. But there was a campaign okay. called Don't Drive on the Five, and it was about getting people to cycle with my right. neighbour, funnily enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Okay. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's what it's just a picture that I found googling Richie's name, so I I liked it. And um, so Richie is the campaign lead for Borough Mancan, and he just wanted to know um, was Borough Mancan working? Where, could could it be made better? Could you know could it could, uh, other areas where improvements could be made? Um, so he got in touch with a service called Ask Fuse, which is um, a service that Fuse, which is a, a, a kind of collaboration of partners across the Northeast, um, uh, Ask Fuse is there for policy and practice partners working in public health to come along with research questions and try and make connections with academic partners. That's what Richie did. Uh, the Ask Fuse service put out a, a call throughout the Fuse network. And so I responded from Newcastle University. Uh, George Austin Nick from Teesside University and uh, Simon Forrest from Durham University and we had a couple of meetings uh, probably in a way that is a bit frustrating for practice partners and your know, academics kind of scratching their chins and going this is all very interesting what can we do but also where we're going to get the money from to actually do some work um, but then really nice timing at the start of 2020 uh, the ARC came along with the open funding call so the ARC is the applied research collaboration for the North East and North Cumbria they put out an open funding call, not huge pots of money, but we weren't trying to do a, a really big project at this point. We thought, let's just start small and really understand what Borough Mancan is all about. And we uh, worked together on a plan for that money and got it. And um, that's enabled us to kind of continue this partnership over the last couple of years, really, which is really nice. Some other people involved. So at the point of putting the application together, uh, so Mabel wasn't involved at that point, but she's been the kind of lead researcher on this. Um, Chris Haywood also works at Newcastle University and Stephen Burrell and Brett Smith are from uh, Durham and then you've got practice partners I really love this picture of Idris he looks so cool and then Katrina also from Public Health Southeast Jo Cook I couldn't find a picture for she was the um, suicide prevention coordinator for South Tees, but she's moved on to a different post since then and then the people on the right hand of the screen are some of the most important people in this research that's our three peer researchers you've got Neil John and Matthew and uh, it's um, Neil was really sorry that he couldn't be here with us today unfortunately he's working but he's um, you know been really actively involved throughout the research as have John and Matthew and you're going to hear from them in a little bit so what do we set out to do? So because there wasn't a huge amount of money available and because Borough Mancan is a, quite a complex sort of public health intervention, um, we, we decided we'd do something called an evaluability assessment. So that's a bit of a mouthful, but basically we weren't trying to do an evaluation. We, we weren't hoping at the end of this to say it works, it's effective. Um, we were hoping to kind of start the process of thinking, could it even be evaluated? Are there certain bits that are more evaluable than others? Try and work together on an evaluation plan for the future and think about which outcomes um, should and could be measured. Uh, but also we wanted to do something a bit broader and think about views and experiences of people linked in with Borough Mancan and try and get a real understanding of um, are there any remaining barriers to local men getting the help that they need? And that's, I know, something that Richie was particularly interested in. So like kind of what more could Borough Mancan be doing? So what do we actually do? Uh, so we, we did kind of follow the steps of evaluability assessment, but the pandemic and doing things remotely have made it really challenging to uh, get a whole range of stakeholders together in a way that we would have liked and get people in a room and have a, a wider range of people involved in uh, coming up with an evaluation plan. Uh, so I think we, we've, we've done a pretty good job. Uh, so these are the kind of steps that we went through. We conducted a scoping review of literature on kind of similar health promotion interventions and campaigns targeting men specifically and trying to look at how they've been evaluated and see what we could learn. So we're not going to talk about that today, but you can read about that in the report um, if you're interested. 
we were really interested in exploring the lived experience of the Borough Man campaign. So that's kind of quite an, just an academic way of saying, you know, we, we, we talk to people, um, people who work with Borough Man Can, people who volunteer, some of the partner organisations, but also local men to see what they thought of the campaign, um, whether it's something that would appeal to them. We brought partners together. Uh, we had a, a kind of participatory workshop to think about next steps. And like I said, this is one of the things that we hoped would be a, a, a bigger thing involving lots of stakeholders. And it just wasn't really doable because of the pandemic. And we didn't think it would work very well online. So a smaller group of us met, um, had a, a nice workshop. Uh, one of the objectives we, we did definitely achieve was that we were hoping to engage, train and work closely with local men as peer researchers. The initial plan was to uh, engage five men and we did R Richie signposted them to us which was great but two of them unfortunately had to kind of drop out for um, personal or work related reasons but the three that we uh, ended up with throughout the process worked really hard and kind of exceeded our expectations around what that element of the research was going to look like which was fantastic and then what we hope this is a bit still a bit of a work in progress is that we want this work to not just be about borough man can but about broader kind of knowledge on men's health and masculinity and kind of understanding those barriers and enablers to men actually getting the help that they need and this like kind of repeats a little bit of what i've already said sorry i realize i've eaten into richie's time now but um it's got some of the numbers on there so we interviewed five Borough Man Can partner organisations, six staff and volunteers, that should say, and seven intervention deliverers. So Mabel's going to talk a little bit more about those interviews and the um, peer researchers talked to 23 local men. So you can see that was the most successful element of the research, which is fantastic. And then we had this workshop at the end. And then how will the findings be used? So I'm really keen for this not just to be a, a, a big stack of papers that lands on someone's desk and gathers dust. Um, you know, we really wanted this from the start for the findings to be useful by Borough Man Can and other people interested in men's health to kind of inform future service development and also monitoring and evaluation. And I know that Richie has provided some really nice feedback on the report that it's already changed his way of looking at things and what he's planning to do in future. Um, we will use it to, you know, we have to do a final report for the funder and that's the thing that's almost ready and can be um, made public and shared with all of you at some point. We want to uh, continue this partnership, put together applications for future research funding and also we'll be publishing this and presenting it at conferences, the usual kind of academic outputs. But what we really want is this to be used much more widely. So uh, I've said there'll be a two page research brief, I think there might end up being multiple research briefs for practice partners, for uh, community members, for um, you know different aspects of the research. Uh, we also said we'd do at least one blog entry. Uh, um, I did write a blog to be published today by Fuse, so I'll put the link to that in the chat, um, kind of again coinciding with International Men's Day that sort of summarises mine and Mabel's views on the research and we're hoping that Richie and the peer researchers will write their own blogs that we can share. John has actually written his own blog and published on his website and I'll share that link as well in the chat. Um, we're hoping to get features on community radio and the Borough Man Can podcast and just try, you know, try to think of ways that we can reach a, a wide range of audiences. And what I'd really like to do is have articles or briefs either produced by the peer researchers or um, closely in collaboration with them. So look out for all of these um, outputs. You're, you're kind of on the priority list now to receive those things. Uh, and if you want to find out more, you can contact me. Um, you've all got my email address now uh, and I know that you can also contact Richie if you want to know more about Borough Man Can and he'll give you his contact details that's all I wanted to say sorry if I, I've eaten into Richie's time a little bit and I can see there's things in the chat um oh stop sharing sorry there you go pa Padlet, so, if you can post the Padlet link uh, I will post Shireen, the Padlet think, now yeah, yeah. great Happy and I'll hand you. over to Richie now let me just click my buttons to get this going right Thank you, Shalina. Um, the uh, Shalina and her colleagues are the professionals that have kept me sort of grounded um, throughout this, and and I'm very. Uh, I don't think I could really express my gratitude enough, really, for their involvement, their kind of passion, to make me feel uh, what sometimes felt like quite a lonely journey. Although I, I appreciate that many people would immediately correct me on that and say you genuinely have never been alone on this but sometimes it's, it's felt like that and so it's been a um, a difficult road over the last five years um, sometimes with this. So um, I'm Richie Andrew, there's my contact details there, the, there's a Borman Can email address for anything that's to do with the website or our social media and you can email me directly about uh, like the wider mental health um, elements that I still lead on uh, within public health. 
South Tees, but I am located within a mental health team. Um, so that's like my primary uh, sort of driver on my work on the work I do. Um, and so mental health is something I've sort of have to keep sort of uh, almost campaigning for <laughs> myself um, to make sure that I can I can keep going with it. So thank you for that introduction, Shalina. That was fantastic. Um, so what I want to do is I want to take you through. I'm just make sure this is going to flick through the slides. So um, this is what I'm going to. I want to give you a very a few quick slides, just to, and I'll be sharing this whole presentation as a PDF. So don't worry. And there's a few clickable links in here that you'll be able to use later um, as perhaps a, a resource, you know, to, to get access to the things we talk about. So the the state of national men's health. Um, our local drivers, although the data for that is due an update, um, it hasn't been updated. Um, last time it was updated was just pre-COVID, um, sort of uh, very late 2019. Um, I'm going to take through focusing more of my time on the, the story so far, like how we, you know, where, where it started from and all the way up to kind of uh, working with Ask Views. Um, and then a slide, which is at the resource side about how to engage with Borough Man Can um, right now in all the different ways you, you can. So um, I'll push on. So this is um, the Men's Health Forum. Um, just last week, I think, possibly this week, have released um, a new report, which is to uh, lobby, uh, par continue lobbying for Parliament to have uh, and develop a men's health strategy. Um, and particularly on the back now that there is a women's health strategy uh, in the UK as well. Men's Health Forum have already made, always made it clear that they felt gender-based health strategies, you know, for, for both genders is basically what, what is needed. So, um, and we'd be keen to see that. On that report, they've updated um, some of the national uh, statistics, the drivers around kind of, you know, just verifying the, the case for men's health. So I won't run through uh, each of these and probably some of them won't become, you know, won't be as much of a surprise, but it's important because actually, you know, if you're, if we're asking people to sort of take men's health seriously, we can't just assume that the next person you speak to to make that thing happen um, will just say yes without having asking you the question of why, which is a good question. So this is kind of why I make this information available to you. It's the cell, isn't it? It's the cell of actually why should we justify um, focusing on one gender a specific way? And here's the reasons. I mean, you know, premature death from heart disease, more likely, almost twice as likely to die from cancer. Even within COVID, men have been um, disproportionately uh, uh, affected um, by that and so on. And even when you look at kind of the behaviors of men, you know, it affects them in terms of how they present in hospital, things like alcohol related deaths as well. So there's a, there's a lot to get through, but there's a link at the bottom there, which where you can go to the website to find out more about this report called Leveling Up Men's Health, probably quite a deliberate choice of words there to get the, the government's attention. And there's a PDF version that you can download, which is only a four or five page, but it's, I think two of the pages are the, all the references to the evidence that they use. So if you're looking to put together like a funding application, for example, the evidence is um, that you know that provides evidence around you know the the case for this you've got a document there that you can immediately refer to for the national statistics most of them from ONS and various other pieces of research so always action orientated that's what that's the way we try and think so there's another link here which is to Martin Todd is the um, the men's health forum nationally uh, chief executive and he presented to the equalities committee in the last parliament sometime in the, in the summer just before the, the, they broke up uh, um, in parliament for the summer break. So it's a, it's 17 minutes, extremely, in for, I mean, it's a fantastic 17 minutes in terms of the case uh, for men's health and how, and the, the best shot he could he could put together, which is to be fair, very good in terms of trying to convince him that this is something that's, that's needed. Um, we do have, uh, uh, a, a set of indicators within public health that I developed with my colleague Alistair and full credit to Alistair he maintained that whenever whenever I've asked him to just to update it and so I've, I've got some slides from that but as I said it hasn't been updated since late 2019 and that's obviously often based on data that has a lag to it so the, some, some of the most recent data on these slides might be 20, um, 2018 although if I go back to this slide these are all up to date with uh, these are 2020 update statistics. So that new report is as updated as it gets for the national side of things. So we'll shortly be updating um, some of these uh, slides for which were taken partly from the men's health training, which we do that I'll tell you about in a little bit. So I'm going to rush through these slides quite quickly. But to give you an idea with the, the data up to 20, end of 2017, um, this was the sort of whoops, gone too far there, haven't I? This was the gap um, between uh, the 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 um, least healthy, I suppose, area, um, most deprived area uh, of 
in Middlesbrough and the most affluent. So actually you can see in terms of how serious just within Middlesbrough itself, the difference in um, life expectancy for males can be. So it's, in, you know, over 11 years and that'll be getting updated quite shortly. But as, as, as I understand it, it's kind of it leveled out for a section and then it's obviously increased um, a touch as well in the last 18 months. Um, this is the under 75 mortality rates by um, four of the most common causes of death. And this is particularly, this would be particularly be like over the age of, of 50, under the age of 50. I'll, well, I'll come to that in a second. But you can see I mean, when you start to compare males to females in terms of those those under 75 mortality rates and they use 75 because that's that's regarded as, as like the standard they use for like average life expectancy um, that they, they sort of consider. So it's like a, it's a baseline they've decided upon and then it's it's a standardization that they use from that point onwards. And you can see, I mean, it's quite stark, the blues and the pinks there. So, um, you know, to justify kind of where work needs to be focused. When you look at um, rates of death compared to, let me just move my screen out of the way a second here, um, compared to Northeastern England, you can see for cancer, is the first one circulatory diseases all the way through to suicide and deliver disease. Um, so the blue is Middlesbrough, the orange is northeast, and so you can see that what it's saying is, is you know, is, is for men it's it's worse than the the regional average, and then of course for England it's much worse. But actually, what it gives here is numbers, and I always sort of say with this slide, it's kind of it emphasises the fact that every single um, individual. Who will make a difference to who makes significant changes it really does matter because it, you can actually count them in numbers under under 100 in, in cases of exactly how you know per year um, how much this is so it's it's important it's important in every single case um in terms of in terms of suicide in 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 middlesbrough this was 2016 2018 data and i uh, my understanding is that it hasn't increased a huge amount as of yet certainly the suicide attempts and self-harm has taken quite an increase from the data more recent data that we can see but generally speaking across the board it's usually about three quarters of suicides are, uh, are, are males and so it is it's a huge issue and usually about 80 percent of suicides um, are unknown to services so it's something that happens out of the blue so when men um, or find themselves in that situation they're not reaching out to services they're not even often reaching out to the family and even coming into the venue where I'm actually doing this presentation from today I was chatting to the receptionist who knows me um, and I've just been told that a cousin um, of hers in, in his in his 20s took his life last week and so it's, it's almost like you can't walk you know it's almost, you're more and more affected by by this and, the, and of course the after effect of it is even more severe as well um, so it's really serious and actually quite quite troubling um, for you know as a, as a topic area but when it comes to under 50s um, suicide is the biggest killer of, of males under under the age of 50 um, and it's more than double that of like road traffic accidents as well so when under 50s look in, in the mirror the greatest risk to their health and their life is themselves their mental health um, alcohol related conditions show us something they tell us they tell another story in terms of admissions to hospitals uh, again way more males than females um, and in terms of access to services uh, this, this shows you along the, the bottom that, that uh, purple triangle lines you can see that there's a sort of up till the age of sort of 10 and then until the age of sort of 50s uh, there's a there's a real leveling off of male accessing services and there's there, even when you remove uh, reproduction reproductive events for women you can still see there's quite a significant gap there more than and it's when you see that in services generally speaking most health services provided there to you know for prevention and treatment it's about one it's about one third males particularly for like gp access um and and certainly for things like counseling uh, like you know psychological counseling and therapies it's it's not reflective of the of the health problem so the things we put in place to deal with the problems aren't uh, proportionate to the people that should be accessing them and in this case I'm, I'm talking about men so um let me let me go into these slides a bit more detail so um Burman Khan was was actually so when I, I transferred over to public health in 2014 uh, and when I did uh, our head of service at the time I asked to start to look at well it's actually in 2015 start to look at insights into men's health in Middlesbrough let's get a picture of kind of what's happening um and start to understand like you know what might be the the problem what sort of things can we do um, and so we worked with a postgrad student um, at Teesside University through one of their schemes one of their uh, postgrad schemes who then completed a three-month internship with us and you know did research with 34 different organizations and produced uh, an insight report almost on almost, almost complete but it was it was 
close it, but in the end, we ended up going with an executive summary version that had all the good detail in there and actually had a set of recommendations, which I'll share um, on the website, but I'll share an email that goes out to all members um, who have attended this as well. And so, I mean, I won't run through everything that, that's, that's on here, but you can see the types of activities we were doing leading up to that insight report. So immense, I've always been involved in workplace networks and it seemed to make sense to try and network people together who had an interest in men's health, whether it's community development side of men's health, whether it was transforming um, a, a, a mainstream service and trying to cater better for males. It's quite a diverse network and that continues to this day with over 400 members. Um, and if anyone, there's more details at the end. So if, you, if you're keen to join that network, I can get, I'll provide more about that. Um, so the recommendations uh, showed up quite a few things, but one of the things it showed up was that we needed to really look at kind of um, a campaign around culture shift um, and around building a me and creating a men's health plan that sort of gave it uh, gave something to services and community partners on a plate. Say, look, if you if you want to do something better for men's health and you want to cater better to men, here's some of the things you can do. And so we wanted to take a sort of plan on a page oversimplified you know uh, approach towards it because actually that makes it more palatable and easy to sort of pick up as well so we went through all the usual stages consultations and developed it from 12 priorities down to six um, and we've got that and then people started to develop um, projects on the on the back of that through the the men's health network as well and so we had a men's health put us together this men's health plan we developed an oversight group um, and that was all in 2016 and things were moving uh, quite quickly and there was a little bit of money attached to it through public health we could get things doing and and what i think it was 20k and we set up a um a sort of grant fund um for um for that might be a little bit uh, was it on the previous slide jumping ahead of myself i should really look at the slides before i start talking about things shouldn't i um Digress. Anyway, the, the the men's shed pilot from we're working with Groundworks and a couple of the partners was actually putting the name of Borough Man Cannon Public Health South Tees to our, some of our partners. You know, so we're gonna and they could use the men's health plan as a as a like a, as a tool as a resource within funding applications. To say this is the evidence. This is kind of what's happening in Middlesbrough. This is a strategic approach towards it, and this project would support those strategic needs. So it added weight. So, you know, it actually gave weight to those applications so that people had something um, more directed that they could they could start to do. We also started to do, uh, we started to see people trying out new things. The Teesside University did a healthy heart screening program that was directed and marketed, particularly at men. And where they had it open um, for both genders pre previously, they'd only had a handful of men. When they did that, they had over 60 attend and it was really well attended. So they st we started to see tasters of kind of people taking a dedicated approach we were running showcase events that were very well received and actually it wasn't until they were gone when i had to move into my role in mental health that i think we fully realized the the uh, the value of those it was a chance for people to get together listen to two or three men's health um services projects present about what they're doing and then network and so many projects fell out of that those connections and i don't think we fully realized at the time the the, the value of that so one of the proposals is, is to get that up, back up and running, you know, through like virtual and face-to-face -face, um, showcase events as well. And so that you'll see with the taste like the don't, don't let it go to waste campaign, our weight management service tried out. And then since, since then, like Middlesbrough Football Club have picked up some of that experience and have been running successful physical activity, weight management combination sort of programs as well. So, so much of Borough Man Can at this point still existed out in the community. It was like others who were then picking up, you know, believing in the in the approach and starting to test and learn from from different approaches and I'm still hugely grateful to that because I don't think we'd be here today if those things hadn't happened um, and so if you're one of them um, thank you we worked with the men's health forum nationally um, to develop, develop a train the trainer program for men's health champions so health champions like you get uh, you might be well familiar with but we wanted to deliver something which had how do you do so, how do you market differently to men how do you use language differently how do you structure something differently where do you locate it who do you work with how do you find the men and recruit them into it and all that kind of stuff was put into a one-day training course um, that was run by the by these trainers in, in a pilot um, that was quite successful and the last time that was delivered was in 2019 with groundworks as the lead through our capacity building team led by katrina jackson and they have continued they trained another 55 uh, health uh, male champions 
who created their own little action plans about how they would use the learning within their own service. So there's a huge amount of work like that's, that's gone on, but hasn't actually been that well captured. And that's sort of a failing, probably of capacity of myself to put into Borough Mancan, but something we probably need to do a lot more of um, in the future. 2018, we launched a branded campaign at uh, Dry Bar in, in Middlesbrough with a, a stand-up comedian and a quiz night. And then men, men who have already shared their stories with Borough Mancan, um, through case studies. So it would be men who have made significant changes to their life, which has impacted positively on their health. And it could be one was prostate cancer, one was uh, weight loss, and, and there was many other examples. And they would get up and they would, they would, I would do a little Q&A with them. And I think the, the feedback from that night was that it was hugely inspirational. People had a really good time and actually felt motivated to go on and do things themselves as well. So that's when we had the grant funding scheme. So the grant funding scheme, I think it's about 20k we've had two rounds essentially there was there was one we did just purely for Borough and can and that triggered 12 i think 12 different projects and then working with the suicide prevention lead uh, and some monies that came down for suicide prevention for men's projects there was two rounds of grant funding that came through that as well so we've had a lot of projects that have happened as a result of that as well and quite as i'm I'm discovering this last couple of week, weeks, quite a lot of them have continued on um, as well. My colleagues in the Head Start team in Public Health, South Tees, um, one of the one of the James, who's who's um, one of the Head Starters and one of our members of staff within the Head Start team, um, started delivering uh, male-only sessions as Head Start within schools, and had really good results with it, and found that that approach worked quite well. So really chuffed to see that. We oversight group in April 2018 was halt, halted whilst public health Southies were forming across Redcar and Middlesbrough, um, and that was that was a tough tough time for Borough Mancan because ultimately we had to sort of go well you know which teams would be more appropriate for different elements of Borough Mancan and to to be to some degree that's fractured uh, the public health efforts with Borough Mancan, and that that sort of was a risk that was a risk that I recorded myself in terms of keeping this work going. How can you focus on something if there isn't a single person who's responsible for it, but actually has the impetus and the resources and essentially the power to make sure that things happen? And that was that was a that's been a bit of a risk. It's been a difficult one, and so that led me to try and look at. We need to really understand where we've got up to with Borough Can, which led us up to doing that Ask Fuse um, like request as well. We continue to support uh, bids, so. We, again, with uh, with Groundworks, uh, with Frayed, we supported lottery bids that in the first quarter of 2019 brought in quarter of a million. Um, and again, I mean, full credit to them. We put our name to it and they quote the, the priority priorities on the plan. Um, and then there was other bits, again, other smaller projects continuing like Barbers for Health. And then others starting to continue, you know, these these men's sheds, one of them's outdoors, one of them's indoors in like a tool, a tool shed. And there's others. And then we started to, because we were South Public Health South Tees, the membership of Borough Man Can, the Men's Health Network, started to expand beyond Middlesbrough. It was attracting others, you know, Stockton from Hartlepool. But then because we were working in Redcar, we started to work with my colleagues like Sharon Chapel and the health development team there and coordinators to sort of, you know, look at whether or not Borough Man Can is something that could be outside of Middlesbrough. And I think we're at the point where basically, yeah, it, it, it can be. And so we've covered, we've started to expand the network to include those um, projects like Find the Light, Walk and Talk, Lifelines Hub, um, who are all doing, and, and um, Footsteps in the Community, who are all doing, and many more, who are all doing great uh, men's health work as well. So there's been stuff going on with, I mean, uh, IAPT, which is the, the therapeutic um, provider through um, Impact on Teesside. They prioritise places for, for, for dads, um, for perinatal, as well as mums in the perinatal period. Um, we have got a newsletter that regularly goes out for Borough Man Can, and then obviously this this Fuse Network request went in. And during um, it's actually I think we we started talking about it well before the pandemic kicked in. We started produce, we set up uh, YouTube, we set up uh, the Facebook group, which has now expanded to Instagram and, and Twitter, uh, basically to do a podcast and start producing content, video content, interviews with as diverse males from different ages as we could to sort of make sure that when people are making use of the website, which was launched um, in 2020, that they're actually seeing stories that they can relate to and actually, you know, start to sort of interact with that. And so we just see, you know, the way we measure that is, is uh, access to the website, access to those channels, and we, we can start to look at the trends, which videos are doing well and, and so on. And I know that university have used um, some of the Borman Can content within their courses. I know that others have used the videos within their training. And often we don't hear about it. It's just, I hear about it by chance, um, which is great to hear. But it's, it's kind of, you know, we need to, it, it helps us, but we need 
need to know exactly what works and what doesn't back to Shalina and then back to kind of the, trying to understand um, the impact in it. Um, so it is that that is like a quick whistle stop tier of kind of um, of the Borough Man can. It's, it's missed out quite a lot, but ultimately some to, some decisions to be made for the future. If I'm really honest, um, the community and our partners external to public health um, have really made up the, the vast majority of making sure Burman Khan stays alive and supporting it. Um, I've always struggled to get the strategic buy-in across the board within public health. And I'm hoping that the outcomes in this research will be a good opportunity to kind of, you know, um, reaffirm the, the importance of, of men's health. Because I, all the feedback I ever receive is that when I do get it is that it's um, it's valued and, I, and, it's, and it's needed. Certainly evidence the evidence base for it is suggests it's needed and I think we're on something um, if, if I'm being honest but um, I think it's something that will survive by everyone chipping in there a little bit and making sure it, it sort of does that so that's it I'm going to stop I think that's I'm about a minute over um, hopefully that's been a, an okay summary um, thanks Richie we've got a few minutes for questions if anyone's got one there is there's one in the chat from Sharon um, saying how can we get more of the men's men's health champion training please so Katrina's on the call here and we, since last year we've had a couple of K sat, sat aside to commission someone to do it but actually what's happened is the with with the pandemic and a bit of time before that some of those trainers have fallen off from the organizations they were based in so what we need to do is do another train the trainer course basically um, and I drew the, the two trainers that were left, I would bring them in to co-deliver that, I think, and then we can get some new trainers in and then we can, you know, look at funding and um, continue that training. I think it absolutely has to happen. Um, well, that say, from, from my point of view, Richie, I think ideally if we can, uh, at the moment we're a little bit like scrabbling, aren't we too, okay, this would be nice yeah. if we had a bit more um, confidence that that was every year as well, I think. I agree. I'm not sure if... Um, if all the elements of Burman can located within public health is the right place to have them at this at this moment. I think some of the, the research outcomes indicate to me that one solution might be for certain elements of Burman can to be exit to exist in a new VCS organization that potentially could develop into a kick that can actually um, develop, you know, out there in the community and, and kind of have a little bit more um, freedoms in terms of, of what it does and that's not to disparage like, the, the council but things can take a long time and I think you probably can get things done quicker but certain elements of those like training you know you could make that happen quite quickly so that's one possibility to look at um, that might make it work um, a little bit and make it more sustainable away from like the risk and changing environment with funding and so on within within our local authority that's one thought anyway yeah Thanks, Richie. Any other questions before we hand over to Mabel? Just seeing if anyone's got a physical hand up. I can't see any. No? There is a lot more I could have covered. And I think this this slide here gives you the links to kind of how to engage with, with the campaign right now. But it is a lot, a lot of this is being done on goodwill. <laughs> uh, sometimes people working, uh, often people doing stuff in their own time um, to help with the, the podcast and all the other content that we've created. So yeah, I mean, it's about getting on the table with all our partners and all their experience um, and seeing what who can do what and who would like to do what really. Brilliant. Thanks, Richie. And Thank you. as you said, we can we can circulate the slides and documents after to everybody uh, who signed up for the call. Um, so I'll hand over to Mabel now if you want to start screen sharing Mabel. Can't see you on my screen. Oh, there you are. <laughs> there you go. Um, hang on a second. Uh, sorry. I was here a minute ago. Hmm. Have a little rest, everybody. <laughs> there we are. <clears throat> okay. So I'm Mabel Lai, and I'm a research associate um, at Newcastle University. And I'm very uh, pleased to be able to share the findings from the interviews that I've had with the stakeholders. Um, but I will also be sharing a, a couple of quotes from the participants in the peer research. Um, so just the next slide is to give you an idea of the sort of range of people we interviewed. And at this point, I would really like to um, 
record my thanks for all the people who were involved. Uh, they gave up their time and their insights, which were really valuable for us. So the way I'm going to do this presentation is that I'm going to <clears throat> present a lot of the quotes from the interviews that we conducted. There was about, this is a case of distilling about 60 pages of data <laughs> into about 20 slides. So uh, bear with me. Uh, and these um, quotes are organized under certain headings or what we call themes in qualitative research to help us to, to understand uh, where the findings are coming from and what are they saying. But uh, having listened to what Richie was saying, I just feel that what we've done so far is just, just a tip of the iceberg of all the amazing work that the, the campaign has done. And I think our limitations as, as, into, <clears throat> as researchers was that we were conducting the research under very trying circumstances. You know, people were, were weighed down by the pandemic, you know, interviews were being conducted um, on Zoom, on uh, Teams, and it was just a very complex situation. But anyway, whoever participated, I really would like to record my thanks here. So as I was saying, <clears throat> I'm going to be sharing with you a lot of quotes, and it's up to you to read the quotes and reflect on them, and I'll give a bit of commentary as we go along. <clears throat> so the first major theme that seems to be running through a lot of what we were hearing from the interviews was this idea of um, the borough male identity. Um, so Middlesbrough has a very rich industrial uh, heritage and um, that influences what it means to be a borough man, what it means to be a, a man. And, and a lot of it seems to be pointing to the fact that a man has to be strong, not show any weakness, you know, and uh, be able to take all the hard knocks in life um, and just keep everything together and to be self-reliant. And on top of it, there are all these influences from fathers, teachers, women and fellow men as these quotes demonstrate. So this, these are quotes from a campaign partner who works among uh, younger people. And then this quote is from a female campaign partner reflecting on her own treatment of male members of her family. And this is another quote from a staff member reflecting on the pressures that society places on men, you know, the expectations of men, you know. And here's a quote, the next quote is from one of the uh, participants from the peer research. Some men were reluctant to show their real feelings even among their family members. And then men, <clears throat> borough men are also pressured by work and employment issues. So in the case of the present day circumstances, there is a lot, a lot of self-employment and then adds to the pressures on men in trying to suppress their own needs or suppress their, uh, their ability to access health professionals over the issues that they're facing. And then there's contract work, zero hours contract. They have to think about the next contract at work. So these are all the hindrances and hurdles that men face. Then there's also the case of benefits, that some people who depend on benefits are afraid that if they are active or they engage in uh, well-being activities or physical activities, this might impact on their benefits. Then there's this huge stigma of mental health, which I think all of you recognize. So I just have a read of this quite a long quote. So it really explains the difference between physical and mental health. I mean, some of you might uh, challenge the idea that if there's anything wrong with a man, they're straight away to a doctor. But then we also discovered there were generational differences and also class differences to take into account. So maybe the older generation might be more reluctant to access health 
unless it's really, really serious. But positively, there are ways to male health and well-being as well as gleaned from the interviews that we conducted. So we talked about stigma. So men are, avoid stigma by avoiding formal pathways. That can be a useful uh, way of going about it. So they access the charity and voluntary sector instead of going to a doctor. So it's less official. And this is where Barman campaign comes in because they are able to signpost men to the right places. So it's, it's about um, engaging men in the, in the right circumstances in uh, sporting events or venues. Okay. And then men are, have been shown to access health through the, through, through the web online so that they will, will not risk being embarrassed or shamed. And this was quite evident among the peer research participants as well. Men talked about uh, going on mindfulness causes, for example, online causes, especially over the pandemic. So these are all the pathways. And <clears throat> one important um, pathway to men reaching out uh, for help, for the health, is to hear other people talking about their own health. And if they're given the permission to start, start to talk about their own health too. They're not the only one. So providing a sense of purpose. Now this heading came to me because it struck home when I was speaking to one of the uh, intervention deliverers or partners, where he gave this account, which was really quite heartrending, really, and here it is. So what this says to me, I don't know what it says to you, but it says to me that men have to have a reason for trying to access care as soon as possible or to, to take care of themselves. And sometimes this sense of purpose can come from uh, service providers. So if you read the next quote, it gives you an idea. So in this case, you can see that there is um, give and take. So they're giving something, they're feeling a sense of purpose, but they're also receiving, and it's all about the five ways of health and well-being that's being promoted, isn't it? Trust is a very important aspect. So this is a quote from an intervention deliverer who's working in an uh, industry context where he's used to the industry, but he's been employed to provide mental health support. But then there's also this whole area of being non-judgmental not breaking confidentiality, so men having a safe space to talk about their health issues. So I think Richie mentioned a lot of different male-oriented intervention delivery modes, um, but some of this can be uh, delivered within an existing service provision. So in this case, providing the option of a man-to-man -man, uh, discussion about health. And the messaging, the messaging is so important, which mean, is just what the campaign does. Ownership and space. So ownership of their actions, ownership, uh, uh, I talked about the reason for going to, to trying to find some help for themselves. It has to come from the men themselves and ownership of space as well. So in, in the case of men's shed, sharing their skills, 
but owning the space as well and finding a space where they can be completely relaxed and comfortable to talk. So what are the stakeholders' views of the campaign itself? So it's about the campaign showing that they're not alone in the world. They can share their story. Again, about space to think about men's health, but it's not just about men thinking about men's health, but it's also about pro providers thinking specifically about men's health and how to be better providers and how to better meet men's needs. Providing meeting points. Um, Richie talked about the opportunities to showcase events, for example, and they've uh, had very good feedback from the interviews. Um, and also the training courses, a lot, uh, after the training course, the people are able to get together. That was really helpful according to this intervention deliverer. And the networking. And the partnership working. And the outreach, outreach. Publicity, networking and engaging men. Really important. Supporting, so this the independent uh, intervention deliverer talking about how supportive Richie was. Partnership, what's partnership all about? So as Richie said, a lot of this partnership is out of uh, their own backs in the sense of uh, doing things uh, outside of the day job, pro bono. Training. And there's evidence here of how the trainer is able to adapt the training specifically for their recipients. And again, the chance for the trainers to get together and exchange their experiences of training and sharing of ideas. So there's also impact. So service providers can only do things for their particular service, for example, but the campaign is able to have a much wider impact and I thought this was really important to take note of. So looking forward, people are looking forward to getting back together, to meeting one another, because this is so valuable to them. And also there's a, there are a few suggestions about how the campaign be better publicized for example, in workplaces, but also the football club. And this also, this, these suggestions also came from the uh, interviews with uh, local men, what the peer researchers found. And there's a real feeling that this campaign should continue. And I like the, the fact that he's pointed out that there's so much short-termism around. We need to combat that. And we need something that's sustainable. And to do it, we need something fresh. We need to keep it fresh, up-to-date, linked international campaigns. You know, part of what's going on. Because the danger is things like this can get tired. I think you can all agree with that. Now, why? Why do we need it so much? So certainly in Middlesbrough, uh, Richie has pointed out that the need is so great there. It's about prevention.
and the pandemic. We need to think about the pandemic. This can happen again. And we need to make people more robust, as he say, says to. So just to summarize, these are the summary points. I think um, I haven't quite captured everything. It's just a, a lot. And um, there will be a lot more from the uh, peer research interviews as well that I haven't quite covered. So if there are any questions, and thank you for listening. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to go back on the slides to discuss any of the points that I've raised here in this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mabel. There's been lots of really interesting chat in the in the Zoom chat that I've been trying to keep on top of. Um, so I, the only one that looks like a, a question, I think, saying, you know, do men feel the need to suppress their feelings from pressure from women or other men or both? I don't know if you <laughs> give a bit of insight on what we, I don't, I don't know if you can give a definitive answer to that, but you know, what, what did our data suggest? Suggest from a lot of different uh, sources. I think men are, have a lot of pressure placed on them to, uh, and expectations of being the true uh, men that they should be, are expected to be. But then, it, as, as I said, it, it varies uh, depending on class, depending on generation, but it, it just points to a lot more research needed in this area, basically how, how it really works. Yeah. Yeah, there are other questions and comments in the chat about um, not wanting to own up to some of the problems being seen in a negative light, you know, like anger, violence, drinking, worrying about breach of confidentiality to the police. Um, I think Richie's kind of answered that. Yeah, what I thought was interesting in our data, and Richie kind of commented on this in the report, is that quote you used, Mabel, around, you know, um, we've men have got no problem going to seek help, seek help for something physical. Um, it's just if it's mental. And uh, I think it's probably worth flagging up that that might not be true. That's not true of all men necessarily. Like I think we did, I think the, the and the peer researchers are gonna talk next about the types of guys that they talk to, but I think they did try and get hold of people who might have something interesting to say about health and well well-being, and that who for the most part were, Sort of a kind of engaged in conversations about health and well-being anyway so it's not a completely rep you know it's not a representative sample of all men out there you know there's lots of men who won't seek help for anything um, <laughs> but the, the ones we spoke to seem to be that most of them seem to say um yeah I've, I'll, I'll go and ask for help for all sorts of things but probably not mental health and there, there was only one guy who said he'd never been to the doctor pretty much his whole adult life wasn't there um which john might want to talk a little bit more like about uh, any questions for Mabel or any comments on any of that? Ah, I can see Matthew's joined us, which is fantastic. Hello, Matthew. Straight from a oh. funeral, shows his dedication to um, to this research. So if there's no questions for Mabel, Mabel, if you want to stop screen sharing um, and we can have a bit of time for discussion at the end. But yeah, now it's just over to Matthew and John. I don't know who wants to go first, if you've coordinated any sort of double act between you or... Um, yeah, over over to both uh, of you. No, I, would you uh, be happy to go first, John? So I've literally just got in from a funeral. <laughs> no problem, that's fine. Okay, um, well, in, in no particular order, really. Uh, these are just my thoughts from today. Um, and I've, I've just actually realised that being involved in this project has actually been my version of joining a men's shed, if that makes sense. It's just dawned on me. <laughs> um, so really good for my own well-being and, and involvement with others and, uh, and a sense of doing something purposeful. It's like, wow, yeah, I never even saw that at the beginning. Um, so, so thank you. Thank you for letting me participate. Um, yeah. So given the opportunity, men can actually talk about their health and well-being and they can do it really well. They can do it honestly. Uh, they can do it really sensitively and it can be raw. Um, I think it's, it's, it, it does help with the person that's listening on the other side. And I think the interviews, the peer, the peer researcher thing really facilitated honesty to come out uh, with a lot of our men. Um, most men that I spoke to um, 
They've all, they, they've all gone through something. And it's only by going through something that the penny dropped and realised you, you've got to kind of look after yourself in whatever form that takes. So for me, it reflects on there's not enough prevention out there or conversations to, to help men realise, look, it's going to happen anyway. You know, we all go through difficult moments. You don't have to wait for one to happen for you to battle through it, find something that might suit and then be able to talk about it honestly to a peer researcher. Um, every one, of, every, every one of, of my group were had a partner and were living with the partner, and I would say in a safe space, you know, in a safe environment, uh, which it drew my attention to the fact that there's probably a lot of single men out there. That, that it, it's, it's just not the same. It's not so safe. It's not so loving. Um, and it can be quite destructive. So, yeah, that's that. <laughs> um, again, yesterday, a little realisation. There is a distinction between health and well-being, and it never dawned on me. Um, there were, I'll, I'll talk about this in a moment. There were two window cleaners that I invited in for, <laughs> for, for the interviews. And when I came to one of the questions, um, so, so how, how do you think your health and well-being is at the moment, guys? And they were saying, oh, no problem, John, we're fine. You know, we, you know, things are good at the moment. Yet at the same time, I was looking at two packs of 20 cigarettes that they had in front of them. So their well-being, it was obvious at the time, was really good. But the health side of things, and, and, and I wonder if they just made that connection. I, I don't think so. But for me, it was like it was there in front of me. You're well up there, but actually the health side, um, you know, why aren't cigarettes figuring here? You know, what's, what's, not, what's, not, what's not sinking in? I didn't ask them that. <laughs> um, personally, um, I, I interviewed my father and my father-in-law and one of my daughter's boyfriend. And it was fascinating because uh, it allowed me we had a different conversation to normal and we, we, we met on a different level. And all of a sudden I was asking these really personal questions that I would never have dared to ask as a son, son-in-law. Um, and here I was asking them some real personal stuff. And here they were going uh, with the honesty and the rawness and the, uh, the, uh, well, the, the closeness was noticeable, even between like father-in-law and boyfriend, where I, I probably have missed it in the past, yeah? I didn't realize perhaps we were that close. Um, so that was really useful for myself, again. And, and, and I guess useful for them because I was able to, it's taught me, I was able to listen differently. I went in a different mode. Researchers, there's a different form of listening goes on to you kind of listening that just happens in regular life. Um, so that was fascinating, fascinating listening to, to, to people who were really close. And the reason why I got to asking people who were really close is that I, I planned for my five candidates, which were ex-work colleagues from, from, previous, from previous jobs, and everyone was really willing to help. But I enjoyed myself so much. And, and I also, and this research happened at a time when coming out of lockdown, um, my work is my work just disappeared, so this really filled the gap. And this again, this idea of contributing and being involved. So I had loads of time on my hands. So I just carried on going. So I picked on the window cleaners. I picked on builders who were doing some work. The TV man who came around. <laughs> I, I I even thought to myself, you know what? I'm just going to carry this microphone around with me, and you never know what, what will happen. And then I stopped myself because I thought, well, no, because I'll probably get arrested. Um, <laughs> I think the last one for me, uh, on a serious note, uh, and I'll move over to Matthew, one thing that really sticks out was uh, an Asian gentleman, similar age to me, so I'm, I'm 53, um, and he was talking about the difficulties that Asian men have with dealing with homosexuality within, with their sons and male relatives in the family. And that that particular their particular community, uh, he, he wished 
he wished there could be we there could be more open and wished it could be more loving and wished there could be less shame or less stigma. Um, and he was speaking from the heart, poor chap. And I really felt and I really noticed that it's like, yes, we do need community champions within specific communities. That would really help because you're only going to talk to who you want to talk to. Um, but there's particular communities have particular issues. And that issue just struck me stood out a mile um, because ha this is not to be answered now, but you know, how do you support a community with a topic like that with men only or, or even families, you know, uh, uh, to show and highlight a better way forward, you know, because uh, a lot more families could stay together. A lot more young men might not consider suicide. A lot more young men might not consider moving to the big city where they would be alone and at risk of, of dangerous behaviours. Um, so, yeah, yeah. And again, a bit like Richie, there's so much to, to add, but for the moment, I'll stop there. And uh, if Matthew's OK, I'll... Yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, thanks, John. Um, a few of the key things that came out for me, and, you know, I've done a lot of um, my own work and awareness race and what have you around mental health. So I came into this with, obviously, being part of the Borough Man Can campaign. So you know, with my own thoughts and, and, and feelings around mental health, perception of it, etc. It was really interesting talking directly to, to the people I spoke with. Uh, one of the things that really interests me is that uh, our identity and how identity, our sense of identity plays a big role in our, our uh, again, sense of self and, and, and link with our sense of well-being and, and um and, and as John was saying there, I mean, the sexuality uh, and issues around that comes into this in terms of, uh, you know, this idea about who and what we should be as opposed to, you know, where there's a big difference between that and who we actually are can, can cause a lot, of, a lot of stress. And I think the, the whole, uh, one of the things that came through for me is this, there is a strong identity linked to being a, a borough man or a northeast man that the, there's a strong sense of what that is and i think and and i did the um the the borough man can uh training the mental health training that um richie um provided and it was fascinating in terms of helping me see i mean again i'd like to think i'm kind of broad-minded and open to a lot of this kind of stuff but you see how much you, you, you right through your time growing up how you've just unconsciously kind of soaked it soaked up around what's expected of men and one of the things that it would start for me is thing, you know, you never saw your dad take a day off work ill or anything like that. You never saw your dad cry, all of these things that, you know, you didn't question at the time. And so, and, and that thing about kind of the, the crying thing, um, one of the, the, the things that came out for me is this, someone said something about, you know, that you're the one that's there for other people, you know, in the family, you're the dependable one, the shoulder to cry on, you know, you're not the one, you've got to be that for the people and you can't then put your troubles onto them. And it, and, and I thought that was a very, um, again, hearing that kind of spoken um, and, and to the extent, I mean, we, the, there was one that was really powerful, uh, really powerful for me. And I, I, I write, write into big, um, it's really helped me in terms of understanding and, and processing things myself. And, um, but you prompt something around this thing about someone going away in a bathroom, absolutely crying his eyes out and then coming out as if nothing was wrong and no one knew. And I just thought that was really powerful. And it's also really sad that people feel it has to be that way because for me and, and, and this research and echoing what John said, and sorry if I'm repeating the stuff that's also been said when I wasn't here, but um, that, you know, this, when we don't have the fear of being judged, it allows us to open up. And I think this is a, you know, there's a lot of that. And again, particularly when there's a strong sense of what a borough man is or should be. And, you know, someone was saying about how we have these conversations, you know, if, if, if at all kind of down the pub over a pint, you know, all the, the kind of stereotypes, but they're, they're often very true. And, but giving people permission and acceptance that we're all made of the same stuff and we can have these, you know, it's normal to, to have troubles, but actually being able to talk, but then the flip side that, of that, and, the, you know, there's a lot we see, and we see it on social media, there's a lot now, and 
you know, obviously been encouraging it in this research about people being able to talk. But the other side of that is that people need to be comfortable listening. And that can be really difficult. And when you do try and talk to someone and you see that it makes them uncomfortable, again, it can shut you down. So I think that's an important thing. And again, this given this research, you know, hearing lots of men's voices and giving them that permission to talk and not be judged, I think is really important. So that is the other side of it, that having a comfortable listener. And because once people have that, people you know will tell you all sorts, and the, you know they enjoy talk. One of my interviews was was over an hour, and one of the interesting things came up for this particular person. Again, I think a lot of people will kind of identify with it is that you know men can often be, be be doers, and the solution to you know whatever troubles is just get busy, crack on, do this, do that, bury your head in in, in whatever's going on. And this particular guy had said he'd always been like that, had been very driven. Uh, so as that caused to stress to other people that he managed because he puts that over onto them and then COVID hit and that was a big because suddenly he couldn't you know all that activity stopped and he found a way to kind of be active again but one of the things that he that came up for him was that trusting people to him not him being able to release the reins not have to take on a sense of having to control everything and and actually allowing himself to not be 100 miles an hour all the time and, and reducing stress on himself, but also on the people around him. And I thought that was a, a very interesting one. And I think that is how a lot of men kind of deal with or don't deal with, however you want to look at it, it you, um, their thoughts or, you know, any difficult feelings they might be going through. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd been asked to, if Shalina mentioned, I might want to kind of read out the, the, the top poem that I'd written. Um, like I said, this really did kind of um, say that particular comment about the, the, the bathroom just really struck a chord with me, really. I thought it was a really powerful thing. And, um, and yeah, so I just, if you indulge me for a minute too, I'll just <laughs> read this for you. Um, okay, so need to stay strong to hold it down. Keep it together, can't sink, can't drown. Mustn't show weakness, can't ask for help. Got to keep going and pretend all is well. Must keep on the mask, remain tough and proud. Must be a man, no crying aloud. But when you're alone behind a locked door, your shoulders slump and the tears they pour. Once they have started, will they ever stop? Pulling yourself together will take all you've got. Are you going to be long? I need to be in. Just give me a minute. Again, it begins. You dry off the tears, stand tall and straight. Look in the mirror force a smile to your face and you step back outside but your eyes they can't lie she asks you okay you answer i'm fine so i'll leave it there <laughs> so that again is kind of my attempt at kind of summarizing you know i was trying to make things it could be quite complex but breaking it down into the kind of real human emotion of it and yeah so thank you and thank you for involving me in this research and, and the campaign, by the way. I've got a whole amount out of it personally. And, uh, yeah, it was great to be involved and to sit to, to allow other men's voices to be heard as well. So thank you. Thank you both. That was fantastic. It's really great to hear, um, I think, for people, for everyone to hear what men told you and what you you got from that um, and just your reflections on the process in general. I really like John's point about this is your men's shed, kind of a purposeful thing that's been good for your own mental health and well-being as well. Um, so that's really nice to hear because, um, yeah, I really like this kind of co-production participatory research where we involve people from communities and it's not just us academics parachuting in to ask nosy questions um so i think there was uh so lots of nice comments in the chat um a comment from when to go so john saying in response to the point john raised that the, there are some great people working with sexual identity in bme communities uh, which is really good to hear so nigel i think there's a question really saying really nice to hear that the personal conversations had such an impact interesting to see how we can get past the how you're doing yeah fine conversations with family members and close friends and colleagues and action more in-depth conversations so i don't know if there's anything john or matthew uh you learn from the research in that respect um or was it something i think john you kind of made the point that the research being in that researcher role is almost like a separate type of conversation isn't it in a way you probably ask questions you wouldn't have asked your father-in-law or your 
potential son-in-law otherwise kind of thing. So, I, I, I even sat next to my father-in-law. Can you believe that? I sat next to him. <laughs> Which might sound weird, but I've never sat next to him. He's got his chair. You wouldn't dare sit in the chair. And he's a lovely fellow, but you just... He has a, he's like a security zone around the chair. You just don't go near it. And uh, he just went, come in, John, sit down. No barriers, no nothing. We were doing something different. Well, you know, and then I got up and then the next day, it's like, you know, it's like I got the growl. Don't sit there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, a different perspective. Um, yeah, a different perspective, isn't it? A different um a different role hmm. yeah and i know neil the third peer researcher who could join us today he would probably say the same thing he interviewed his two sons and said you know you have to put a different hat on in the kind of researcher role and said he, he learned things about them that they're a really close-knit family but he still learned things about them that he'd never known um and i said did you then discuss those things after and he said well no that was that's the research interview and then i took my researcher hat off and i was back to dad which i think is really interesting as well um i'll just see if there's any more questions or comments in the chat i mean everybody loves the poem matthew so um thank you Rich richie wants to get that one on the podcast definitely um Leah saying, thanks, John. I think the point about knowing what's best for communities and having role models within those communities or even champions it is potentially a step forward to ask what these communities need or how things can be helped rather than making assumptions ourselves. So a safe space to have an open and honest conversation. And I think that echoes some of what Mabel said earlier about creating these safe spaces, male friendly spaces where men can feel comfortable to talk about their feelings or problems or mental health, because I think what you what Matthew and John and Neil have said throughout this research is that it's not true that men don't want to talk. They just need to be given the freedom and the permission and the, the right kind of space to talk. Um, anybody, so someone saying, can you send the poem and they're gonna put it on the staff wellbeing notice board. Is that all right, Matthew? Are you happy for me to? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah, so when we send out the presentations and things after this meeting, we'll send the poem as well. Brilliant. Um, yeah, so just lots of nice positive feedback in the chat there. Anybody got any questions or comments? No, can't see any hands right. up. Oh, yeah, John. Yeah. Um, quickly, I just posted something on LinkedIn the other day, and, and a man replied from the local college we'd never met before. Uh, he's an English teacher. And he said, John, I like, I like what you do. And I, I say, him, I say, well, what is it that I do? But... I gave him a task. I said, go, and go back to the college and go and investigate creative writing for men or something like that, because this poem thing keeps coming, cropping up. Yeah. Um, but with this idea, we, 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 you don't need, you don't need an organization. You don't need um, rules and regulations. You just need, because my head was like, because if you go and find that and suss that and find the money, we can get in contact with Borough Man Camp. Yeah. It's like dropping, there's so many people we all know who can do something, find something, source something. And we can all do it on our own. We can do it really quickly, like um, Richie's mentioned. Instead of being being too formal about it, just kind of let it, let it run with it. I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you, John. I don't know if, Richie, you want to add anything to that. I mean, I think that is the, the model, isn't it? That it can't just be you and Idris and a couple of other people doing everything on men's health. It has to be that kind of network. It can't. And look, I, I uh, in terms of things like just creative writing, we've obviously got like the website where you can just post blogs and we can give people access to do that. We can then record them and put them, put them out on the podcast. And, and it's how you organise it. So a big part of it is how what we kind of have to keep looking at is how the website's organized, how the content's organized so that men can find what they want. And so we've started like on YouTube, you'll see there's different themes basically, you know, what kind of like, you know, we've started to split the videos into different areas. And I think that's the same, that's the same thing. It's like, well, when a man lands on it, if a man finds the Borough Man Can website, he's either been referred, told about it informally, he just finds it accidentally on through social media. What is it the one I say, what's the first thing? What sort of questions might they be asking to get to the con the right content? And so we need to consider that. And the use of language is something I think we've, we've with the campaign we've kind of nailed down quite well. Um, it seems to come too easy to me and uh, and to others as well sometimes. The the foul language it's terrible. On the on the topic of capacity to make this happen, it it 
that's where I'm stuck. And I, I've spoken to, um, because I, I don't know whether to keep, I can think of certain elements that could stay within public health. I can think of certain elements that might be better out there, basically. But the ownership of it and the, the drive on it and the organising for things like the showcase events, even the capacity to do the website and so on, is something that needs to be have a really good, I think, through. Um, but I realise that uh, doing that in isolation would be, would be, you know, wouldn't help those things. So I think a bigger discussion with the right people um, in the voluntary sector within, you know, local authority and everywhere else would be would be the way forward to do that. So I think the networking element is going to be huge. Um, so yeah, that's that's the direction we hope to go, for sure. Thanks, Richie. And I, I think just to sort of sum up, our research has really shown that there is a lot of support out there for Borough Mancan and this type of model of, you know, there were a couple of queries from some of the stakeholders in the research around, well, do we really need something specific to men? Does that stigmatize or, you know, is that good for gender relations? Um, but actually, overwhelmingly, what people were saying was that particular messages and particular activities appeal to men and some of the things that appeal to women are not going to work for them so this kind of targeted approach the like you said the, the language not necessarily the final language but you know the, the, the informal language and the stories that are shared on the website I mean, it's been, even in the chat there today lots of positive comments on the podcast and all of the online elements that have been really valuable to people throughout the pandemic and hopefully now going forward, um, not that the pandemic's over or anything, but, you know, hopefully there'll be more potential for face-to-face, -face, getting some of that more in-person networking and, and events back online, because um, I do think, and, and this webinar shows, you know, most people who'd signed up were from the voluntary sector um, and really sort of passionate about either men's health specifically or having a men's health element in the work that they do with local communities. So yeah. I think there's a lot of enthusiasm for this model. And it's a preventive model. And I think that's reflected in, in the VCS. VCS does a lot of support to people, obviously, who who have who probably would have benefited from things further down the line. But I think VCS is very good at actually providing things that are truly preventative. And it's like, and sometimes it's not even intended that way. Like John said there about his his benefit of, of becoming part of essentially what's like a men's shed, a group of people come together with a, a purpose that they all believed in and sharing that experience is something which doesn't have to necessarily be, be planned that 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 way. It's it's quite a bizarre thing, but services themselves, the, the examples of services that are in our original report, uh, uh, sorry, since we had the original report, some services actually took a jet, call it, it's very boring sounding, but gender dis gender disaggregated data. So they looked at how uh, men and women within access different activities that they do. Um, I think it was Aging Better was one of the examples that did this. And the feedback they gave was that they were quite surprised actually when they looked at the data to see, to see um, that men were accessing and keen on activities that they weren't necessarily marketing you know, to, for so actually, that's a useful activity that anyone can do, um, just to see the the preferences of men because it might throw up a different age groups, it might throw up some surprises, as well. But there's loads, there's there's so much we can do, but um, it's working out where that where that's going to come from, and we're up against the the challenges, aren't we, about capacity across the board and funding across the board. But I think there's this is where I think the split between local authority and doing it out there in the community might give the freedoms to the right place that allows it to develop and not go away so that's what I'm that's my hope is is, is that we can get this well the, the last thing I would say as well is on the research when I've looked through the research is the constructive criticism about it is actually like I think one of the one of the things was about I just haven't seen it enough it should be in the gazette it should be all over Facebook it should be like, well we haven't had a marketing budget that's for sure but fundraising out there could definitely you know could could be something that can that can contribute towards that. I'd like to see Burman Can. My vision is clear clear on this. I'd like to see Burman Can as being the brand that anything that is specialised towards men men's health locally is is attached to. Then that's a, and ultimately what it means is that men recognise that as a brand that represents all the things that we've talked about that men need to see: safe spaces, language that they can relate to, you know, things that where other men are opening up and they're inspired to get involved. That's what it's all about, I think, for me. Brilliant. Thank you, Richie. That's a nice point to end on. And I can't believe we've kept time. But um, thank you, everyone, for attending today and for joining in with some of the discussions, either in verbally or in the chat. I think there's been some really nice positive feedback on 
on Borough Man Can and, and the peer research in particular as well. Uh, we'll we'll circulate the slides and I think the end of Richie's presentation had the kind of call to action around how you can all get involved in Borough Man Can and uh, you get your stories on the website and all of that kind of thing. Um, and what I'll do, I'm, I'm not going to abuse the, the, the mailing list for this event. We'll, I'll send out the, the, the slides and Matthew's poem and then in probably two or three weeks time when the the final report is all ready and submitted to the funder i'll send that as well um and then I'll, I'll i'll not keep bombarding you with different things but you can always get in touch if you want to know more or uh sort of follow on twitter you know borough man can or me and see what, when, when we get things published we'll we'll be sharing things far and wide um yeah so that's all i wanted to say thank you everybody um and enjoy the rest of your your afternoon and your weekend thank you i'll stop the recording